Now, down in Washington, Special Counsel Jack Smith also is pushing for a gag order on Trump. I mentioned that even though these are completely separate cases, how they work, the rulings, the resolution are completely separate jurisdictions. One is the state system and civil, the other is the federal system and criminal. But if you've heard about gag orders and are wondering, okay, why so many gag orders? Well, what all these cases have in common, and sometimes the news is simple, sometimes the truth is simple. What all these cases have in common in this instance is the defendant. And the civil defendant who was just gagged in New York today also faces calls to gag him in the federal case, where Jack Smith is arguing that a targeted, a, what we would call a partial gag order, is necessary to protect witnesses and other people in that case. So we are still awaiting a decision in that case where that issue went all the way up to the D.C. Court of Appeals. Now, things are not looking very promising for Donald Trump there for a variety of reasons. In the special counsel case, moving beyond the gag orders to the trial he actually faces in March, well, there are outlets reporting one of Trump's lawyers testified to the special counsel. She told him that it would be a crime to resist complying with the subpoena for the Mar-a-Lago documents. Jack Smith overseeing both Trump federal cases. That's the documents espionage case and the coup case that we've been talking about more recently, and that is, of course, scheduled for an earlier trial. Now, NBC News has not confirmed the reports you see on your screen from The Times and ABC there, but they are damning the lawyer reportedly telling Trump very clearly it's going to be a crime if Trump refuses to comply, and that Trump, quote, absolutely understood the warning. There was also the advice, advice of counsel, you may have heard that term, quote, you've got to comply. Now, when we show you this quote and this type of evidence, the reason this is bad for Trump is that sometimes you can argue that you were confused or that you were so confused that you didn't evince, you didn't have the level of criminal intent required to prove that you should go to jail for a crime, for breaking the law. We have our experts on, our lawyers on, and others who talk about those elements. Sometimes people say, gosh, Ari, it seems frustrating. Why is it so hard to prove? Why does it take so long, etc.? Well, the reason is this ain't a parking ticket. In the United States, when the rules are enforced correctly, the defendants not only have rights, but they have all of the benefits of the burden being on the government. The government has to prove not only that you did it, but that you intended to do it, that you meant to do it, that it wasn't just some mistake or blunder or even car accident. A car accident where people die is a tragedy. But it's not a murder unless the government can prove that you set out to use your car to take a life. And misplaced documents aren't usually always convicted as espionage-related crimes unless you really set out to do that. And so that evidence is really bad for Trump if a jury's going to hear that not only did he do it, because there's literally no factual debate about the documents, they found him. You've seen him on TV. But not only did he mean to do it, but he was warned doing it would be a crime, and he went forward anyway. That adds the evidence of criminal intent. As for the advice of counsel defense, that's the related issue where maybe you are able to find some lawyer or some memo where you say, I thought I was doing what they wanted. I was trying to follow the rules. Well, there's someone who knows a lot about that type of defense and how Donald Trump may allegedly misuse it. Take a listen. Donald cares for no one or anything other than himself. He will now start blaming things on the lawyers. Well, the lawyers told me to do it. Quite frankly, the lawyers told me. I'm not a lawyer. That's what I hired them for. And he's going to throw them under the bus, and they know it, and that's why they're all out there protecting themselves. Michael Cohen there speaking to our colleague Katie Fang on MSNBC on this program, and he's referring to something he lived through. He even did a bid partially for convicted crimes on behalf of Trump, partially for other things that basically he pled out to for his own behalf. But altogether, he's talking about what Trump does as a client. There are also new details about the coup efforts, because we've talked about all the different ways you get evidence. Liz Cheney's books made ways, Jan Six committee, but then you have all of these other ways that some of this evidence has been held. And so texts from Republican Congressman Scott Perry have now become public revealing that he had this vast web of contacts that he was talking to, these different contacts where they were discussing how they might overturn or steal the election. And it included, really, a who's who of the Republican Party. People like Ronna McDaniel, Mark Meadows, some of these names you recognize, White House Counsel's Office, the Director of National Intelligence. That's a pretty serious position with security clearances and national security powers. The Trump campaign lawyers. And, and this is an interesting one you see on the upper middle right there, Trump official Jeffrey Clark. Well, that name is familiar because it ties a link from the Justice Department to the Republican Congress to Donald Trump's 
alleged conspiracy because Mr. Clark is an unindicted co-conspirator in Jack Smith's coup case. And when we take this all together, we've shown you some of these individuals have already pled out. They are guilty. They are convicts. And we can show you here on the screen, you'll look at basically you have some from the Washington case and the Georgia case. And you see Clark in the lower right, a co-conspirator in the DOJ case, now tied to this Republican congressman. At the time, nobody knew in public, there wasn't even a single article about that level of advanced plotting. Mr. Clark, as you can see in the yellow lower right, has been indicted in Georgia for that stuff. Legally, he's presumed innocent, but there's a ton of evidence that prosecutors say means they can convict him. And if you scan your eyes over, you'll see people like Miss Ellis, who was already convicted in Georgia and who's pledged to, pro to uh, cooperate with prosecutors. So all of this together shows that rising heat. And now take a look at how some of this fits in. Was it your understanding that Representative Kerry was pushing for a specific person to take over the department? He wanted Mr. Clark, Mr. Jeff Clark, to take over the Department of Justice. He said uh, something to the effect of, uh, I think Jeff Clark is great, and I think he's the kind of guy who could get in there and do something about this stuff. The kind of guy who could do something about this stuff has to be translated to one of the few people working inside the Justice Department who would actually partner up with the outgoing losing candidate, Donald Trump, to try to overthrow President-elect Biden. That's what Jeffrey Clark was. And let, look, I've said this before, Donald Trump's not running for a second term, he's running for a life term. These are the type of people, some of whom are indicted, some of whom are convicted, that would come into power in a second term. This is exactly what he wanted to do when he thought he was losing power. He's going to continue, and he said in public, he's gonna use the DOJ, he said it, in the last week or two, we're not running every soundbite of everything Donald Trump says as a candidate, but this is all going to be public for people to consider as they cast their votes next year. These are the people he wants in charge. He's publicly identified the DOJ as the place he wants to do it, to punitively, potentially illegally, go after his critics, opponents, enemies. It's a playbook from other countries, but it's also a playbook from Donald Trump's failed coup. Now, Clark went through Perry to try to get access to more sensitive intelligence about election results than he had access to as a DOJ official, telling Perry, quote, tell the president, the CIA chief, quote, needs to get me these security clearance tickets. Perry replies, referring to then outgoing President Trump, POTUS is giving you a presidential security clearance. So you got to ask yourself, as we learn more and more and more about this, why do you need all these cutouts and intermediaries? Why would someone in the executive branch, Mr. Clark, who, as I mentioned, is now indicted in state court and an unindicted co-conspirator by the DOJ where he once worked, why does he need to go to a different branch, the legislative branch, to then connect back up to the person who, for a few days at least, left was still the head of the executive branch, Donald Trump? It's not normal. It's secretive. It's suspicious. And while the answer is complicated, it may shed light on why so many people are worried about going to jail for this coup. Would it be the normal process uh, to go from executive to Congress to back to executive to get emergency security clearance like this? And if not, um, what might that tell you with an investigative lens uh, as you look at all of this? Well, of course, it's not at all uh, commonplace. Uh, and it's also not commonplace to be doing this with respect to somebody who was in the civil division and prior to that it was the head of the environmental division it had nothing to do um, with the department of justice looking at potential voter fraud that's that's not his purview um as has been very very clear so this is really because they they wanted jeff clark to issue a letter that was false on the part of the department of justice saying they were looking at fraud allegations. And in fact, um, the D.C. indictment refers to um, Jeff Clark going further than that and saying, drafting a memo that's saying that he actually found indications of fraud. It reminds me very much of what the foreign president did with um, Zelensky. He wanted a foreign country to say that they were investigating his political rival. So it's to me, it's exactly of a piece, which is using a trumped up uh, claim of 
a you know, prosecutor looking into wrongdoing to say, ah, see, there's wrongdoing there with respect to either the election or to a political adversary. Um, but it, to me, it also goes to the idea that we now have not just information from Senator Grassley being complicit. We now have information, as you referred to, with respect to Senator Perry being complicit. Um, and these these are the key people who enable what Donald Trump is doing. Um, and it's sort of shocking that they're sitting members of Congress. Yeah, as you say, part of the the one branch that's supposed to be the most concerned, at least as the founders saw it, with direct democracy. Um, and yet there they are undermining it. And that's that's the sort of one of the, the points right. that lets you know we're in the breach. Uh, as you know, Andrew, a lot of legal issues are complicated. Some are not. Uh, I don't know if you'll agree with, and it's fine if you don't. Uh, my legal reporting that the only thing connecting the gag orders in New York and D.C. is the defendant. Otherwise, they're quite different cases, and they'll go different ways. Um, but what does that tell you, and what do you see in the even more significant question of whether Jack Smith will win the, the partial gag order he wants against Trump going into March? Well, they, they are different um, uh, other than the, the defendant, obviously. Um, it just, it's notable, the one in New York, it's a civil case, and it is the mildest of gag orders. It literally was do not denigrate and cause potential harm for the staff of the court. I mean, like you shouldn't even have to be told that. It's so obvious that that is a rule. Um, I also think with respect to a criminal case, um, I know this sounds like I'm a real pedant, and it's probably true, but I don't really think of it as a gag order. I think of it as a restriction um, that's part of his bail conditions. He's a defendant out yep. on bail, pending trial. And it is true that it does gag what he can say, but you know what else is restricted? His Second Amendment rights. 